we're going to have a quick walkthrough of our IGCSE Biology uh, May June 2019 paper 4 um, the paper is for 1 hour 15 minutes but let's see how we could rush through it within the next 40 minutes or less um, so first the first question here is all living all uh, all commercial breeds of sheep belong to the same species called ovis aries now define the term species simple a species is a group of organism organisms that can reproduce reproduce to produce a fertile offspring to produce fertile offspring that's it two mark now the next question is they said uh, the the merino is a breed of sheep that is farmed mainly for its wool now the wool is very thick and is made of a lot of uh, very thin hairs figure 1.1 shows a female merino sheep with her newborn lamb now uh, the first question here is the presence of hair is a future of only found in mammals states two other features that are found in mammals here you find that there is external ears external ears uh, such as this now uh, these are all external ears now the baby is feeding so uh, feed are young with milk Now, since he has a baby, that means he gives birth to live young. They can, they can change. Give birth to live young. So, you can list as much as you can. Now, Merino sheep is... Merino sheep in South Africa have high quality wool with very thin hairs. They have high quality wool with very thin hairs. Now the question here is, the breeder in New Zealand, breeders in New Zealand have used uh, selective breeding programs to improve the wool of their sheep to match the quality of South African wool. Now describe the step that breeders will take to breed sheep that have wool with thin hairs. So uh, these are just a step. So first you select parent. So the first thing is to select parent. Select parent. Parent with, with thin hair. The next step is um, you now cross breed. You can cross breed the parent. Cross breed the parent um, using you can also using artificial insemination. Artificial insemination. Then the next step is uh, you now select um, offspring with fine thin hairs. So you select from the offspring. Select from the offsprings with fine thin hair. Then you now cross breed the offspring together. You breed 
the offsprings together you breed the offsprings together then uh, continue or you repeat selection and breeding over many generations you continue the selection and breeding over many generations this will continue until you now have a pure breed of sheep with thin wool i think that will give you a five marks now they say explain how natural selection differ from selective breeding uh, this is quite straightforward how natural selection and differs from cross breeding now natural have to do with this have to do with the environment has to do with the environment and different adaptive features of the organisms different adaptive features of the organisms which will lead to which leads to um, leads to competition which leads to competition sorry competition and uh, survival of the fetus survival of the fetus while selective breeding has to do with selective breeding have to do with um, to do with uh, man has to do with man and um, first so man uh, determine 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 which characteristics it prefers to develop in a species okay that's it next question so question number two have to do with uh, photosynthesis so let's see now they said the rate of photosynthesis of terrestrial plant can be determined by measuring the uptake of carbon dioxide now explain why plants take up carbon dioxide during photosynthesis uh, simple this Carbon dioxide is a raw material. Let me just abbreviate it. Sorry. Carbon dioxide is a raw material. Raw material for photosynthesis. Um, so, uh, the higher the concentration of carbon dioxide, and the higher the rate of photosynthesis the higher the concentration the higher the concentration the higher the rate of
rate of uh, photosynthesis. Uh, the next is the rate of photosynthesis of part of individual leaves can be measured using a handheld device uh, such as the one in this photograph called the transparent chamber. Okay, it has a transparent chamber here, sorry. So the apparatus allow air to flow through the transparent the apparatus allow air to flow through the transparent chamber that encloses part of the leaf. Now the apparatus measures the carbon dioxide concentration of the air entering and leaving the chamber. Explain how the results from the apparatus can be used to calculate the rate of photosynthesis. Now, uh, this is also quite straightforward. You subtract, uh, how you do that, you should subtract, subtract the concentration of carbon dioxide subtract the concentration of carbon dioxide carbon dioxide at the end from the concentration of carbon dioxide at the start concentration of carbon dioxide at the start uh, I think uh, that we go uh, so uh, you now divide it by the time taken once you do that uh, divided by divided by the time taken That will give you a two mark simple now the next question is um, a student used the apparatus in this uh, figure 2.1 to investigate the effect of temperature on the rate of photosynthesis of the leaf of Chinese plantain now um, planta that's the scientific name are two different concentration of carbon dioxide a and B now Figure 2.2 shows the result of the investigation. The first question here is, state one environmental factor that should have been kept constant throughout this investigation. Now, one of those factors should be um, humidity, which is the water holding capacity of the atmosphere. Humidity should be kept constant, uh, including the light intensity should be constant. Intensity should be constant. Uh, things like uh, the water supply also should be constant. Now, the next question is, describe the effect of temperature. Describe the effect of temperature on the rate of photosynthesis when carbon dioxide concentration A was supplied. So, effect of temperature when carbon dioxide concentration A was supplied. So let's look at the graph and look at carbon dioxide concentration A. So, okay, this is carbon dioxide concentration A. This is, sorry. We have, um, yes, my mark. Okay. This carbon dioxide concentration A. So as um, temperature increases, the rate of photosynthesis, so as temperature is increasing from 10 to 30, the rate of um, photosynthesis also increases and until it gets to its peak, then it levels off from any further increase in temperature uh, do not affect the rate of photosynthesis at this stage. So uh, the carbon dioxide concentration is constant, so the carbon dioxide concentration doesn't have any effect. So um, it's simple. Describing a graph like this, always try to use statistics. First, from 10 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius, there was an increase of about, this is 15, so in between should be 1. So this is 11, 12, 
from about 12 U um, U mol per meter square to at this point here should be 24 you're about to 24 mol per meter square so for you to get that three mark question you just need to use comparative data and you give a general trend then you get that mark simple so for me to get this i'll say increase in temperature increase the rate increase in temperature increases the rate of photosynthesis increases the rate of photosynthesis photosynthesis so you find out that it increases so it increases from we're looking at um is it not sorry let's screw up and look at this set of data again that we figure out so it increases from 12 to 24 so it doubles it increases from 12 mole per dm cube okay meter square um, to 24 mole meter square at from 10 to 30 degrees Celsius and now and level up and levels of above 30 degrees Celsius simple then the next question say calculate the percentage increase in the rate of photosynthesis at 30 degrees Celsius when the carbon dioxide concentration was increased from A to B as shown in figure 2.2 .2. show you're working so percentage increase um, that's what I want to calculate at 30 degrees Celsius when the carbon dioxide concentration was increased from A from A to B so sorry come in okay um to calculate this um we have to look at it should be old minus new we'll divide by new times 100 over one now we'll go back to our graph let's take the data at 30 degrees celsius so going back to the graph at 30 degrees celsius we now have this so at 30 degrees celsius for a then for b is this so a here is this which is around 22 um, for b so this is a b is 30 so for us now calculate our percentage increase it will be b minus a so it will be um sorry this is it should be that is not correct it should be new minus old over old multiplied by 100 over 1 and our new is 30 which is for b minus old which is 22 
divide by our old which is 22 times 100 if you do this calculation you now have 8 divided by 22 times 100 and your answer will be 36 percent that's all then explain the effect of increasing Explain the effect of increasing temperature on the rate of photosynthesis for carbon dioxide concentration at B. Now, if you go to look at B, uh, the effect of increasing temperature on the rate of carbon dioxide, on the rate of photosynthesis for carbon dioxide concentration at B. So, let's see. At B, uh, as the temperature increases, there is an increase also in the rate of photosynthesis. So a further increase in uh, carbon dioxide concentration at B, which is uh, 1000 ppm, you find out that the amount of carbon dioxide here is high so at this point carbon dioxide is not a limiting factor but what can be the limiting factor of photosynthesis here can it will be temperature so anything that will slow the amount of photosynthesis here is temperature because the amount of carbon dioxide here is quite high so in order for you to answer that question so if temperature is the limiting factor you find out that what is now the impact of temperature on the rate of photosynthesis so once you're able to explain that you get your full three marks so it's not actually uh, a big deal so let's see so first what I'll write here is use the term limiting factor so in this case temperature is the limiting factor because carbon dioxide concentration is high so carbon dioxide is not a limiting factor so first I can decide to say Temperature is the limiting factor is the limiting factor um, CO2 is not it's not a limiting factor it's not a limiting factor now if that they say explain the effect of increasing temperature now increase in temperature I've explained limiting factor now so let me look at increase in temperature. Increase in temperature. Increase in, sorry. Uh, let me erase this. Increase in temperature. Will do what? Increases. Increases rate of photosynthesis. By what? By increasing the kinetic energy. Increasing the kinetic energy of molecules. Molecules which influence the rate at which enzyme and substrate complex uh, and complexes are formed. which increases the rate at which enzyme substrate enzyme substrate complexes are formed enzyme substrate complexes are formed which uh, um, enzyme is usually uh, also a factor that affects photosynthesis. So if you write this, you get your three marks. Kinetic energy, enzyme substrate complex, and also um, the limiting factor to give you a full three marks. Now, the next question here is, the student concluded that carbon dioxide concentration is a factor limiting the rate of photosynthesis between 30 and 35 degrees Celsius for the results shown for A in figure 2.2 state the evidence for this conclusion they said carbon dioxide concentration is a limiting factor 
for B. So uh, uh, it's a limiting factor. Carbon dioxide concentration is is the factor limiting the rate of photosynthesis between 30 and 35 degrees Celsius uh, uh, shown for A. So so let's go back to that graph. Let's see. So at 30 to 35 degrees Celsius for A. So from 30 to 35 degrees Celsius, as you can see from this graph, there's my pen. From 30 to approximately 35 degrees Celsius, but the rate of photosynthesis for A is constant. So how are we going to tell that the rate of photosynthesis is carbon dioxide here is a limiting factor? Is because at B the rate of photosynthesis is higher. So B showed that the rate of photosynthesis is higher if carbon dioxide concentration increased from 370 to approximately 1000. So that's it. It's a one mark question. So B showed that higher rate of higher carbon dioxide concentration uh, will further increase the rate of photosynthesis at 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. So what you do here, you just write B shows that shows that further increase further increase in um, carbon dioxide concentration will increase will increase the rate of photosynthesis at 30 to 35 degrees Celsius. Simple. So the next question is, a similar investigation was carried out on Arizona honey sweet uh, that grow in Dead Valley in California where the highest temperature may be greater than 45 degrees Celsius. The highest temperature may be greater than 45 degrees Celsius. So it said um, the results are shown in figure 2.3. 2 2.3 uh, rate of photosynthesis, temperature of leaf in degrees Celsius. So they say predict and explain. So there are two contents we are looking at here. We need to predict and we need to explain what would happen at the rate of to the rate of photosynthesis if the, the investigation continued at temperature higher than 45 degrees Celsius. So higher than 45 degrees Celsius, what will happen to the rate of photosynthesis? So we need to predict. So at 45 degrees Celsius, higher than 45 degrees Celsius, uh, what you expect that will happen is the max here at 45 you expect that the rate of photosynthesis will either remain constant and further increase will make enzyme to denature and if enzyme denature that means the rate of photosynthesis will now slow down so all what i would need to write there to so my prediction so when you are given a question like this is good you specify if if i'm the one i'll write the predict first so um, the prediction will be the rate of photosynthesis the rate of photosynthesis will decrease or slow down now the next thing you now explain your prediction you give reason so this is because enzymes enzymes will denature enzymes will denature uh, so the active sites will not be able to bind to substrate the active site 
will not bind the substrate. The next question is this. So complete the five sentence about the eye and the nervous system. Complete the five sentence about the eye and the nervous system. Okay, structures in the eye change the shape of the lens so that the eye can focus on near and distant objects. This is called accommodation. The radial and circular muscle in the iris of the eye appears of antagonistic muscles that work together. Uh, now, muscles in the eye are controlled by the nervous system. The dash 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 nervous system contains only sensory and motor neurons. That's the peripheral. nervous system. The dash dash nerve from the eye contains sensory neurons that conduct impulses to the brain. That's the optic nerve. I've even mentioned itself. Impulses to the brain. Five marks. That's all. Now transmission of impulses relies on the flow of ions through the cell membrane of neurons down their concentration gradient. Transmission of impulses uh, relies on the flow of ions through the cell membrane of neurons down their concentration gradient. So we are told that active transport is responsible for maintaining the concentration gradient of ions across the membrane of neurons. Explain how ions are moved across membranes by active transport. Now, what you need to just define active transport. So first, active transport is the movement of ions active transport is the movement of ions um, against concentration gradient against concentration gradient concentration gradient from low sorry that's from high to low concentration from high to low concentration um, using protein carriers on the cell on the gen using protein carriers on the cell membrane On the cell membrane and using protein carriers on the cell membrane and energy from respiration they have brought the light so stop so that's it now they said figure figure um study figure uh, sorry let me see figure 3.1 shows the junction between two neurons the junction between two neurons so that will be uh the junction that separates two neurons is sure referred to as a synapse so the question here will be let's see so many drugs many drugs so obviously here we'll be looking at the impact of drugs on the synapse many drugs interfere with the action of neurotransmitters at the junction between neurons now two drugs that influence the transmission of impulses between neurons are anthropine and serine. now the actions of these drugs are shown in table 3.1 now, drug action at the junction of the neuron. Anthropine block receptors molecules for neurotransmitters. That means it will now inhibit. 
inhibits uh, electrical impulse if it does that then they said a serine block the enzyme that breaks down neurotransmitters so if it block enzyme that breaks down neurotransmitters then obviously uh, a serine will uh, will stimulate stimulate electrical impulse because the enzyme will not be able to break it down electrical impulse so having known that uh, let's look at the question now it's just we're just trying to interpret they say explain the effect these two drugs uh, on the nervous system using the information on 3.1 and table 3.2 so first I will go for the first drug which is um, what is it called a serine so neurotransmitters first neurotransmitters uh, affect the movement of electrical impulse across the synapse so you should know that already so explain the effect of these two drugs so the two drugs have effect on neurotransmitters so what is the function of neurotransmitters so neuro neurotransmitters neurotransmitters affect the movement the movement of impulse across a synapse so if that is the case the first drug there are two drugs anthropine inhibited anthropine so i'll take anthropine first and explain its effects because we are looking at six marks so i know this will give me one mark so any point i give any point as much as i can so neurotransmitters so anthropine inhibits the action of neurotransmitters inhibits the action of neurotransmitters of neurotransmitters sorry let me just of neurotransmitters now what that happen is um, this means this means electrical impulse Um, sorry this means neurotransmitters cannot bind to receptors Neurotransmitters cannot bind to receptors, therefore impulse cannot be transmitted. Impulse cannot be transmitted, and if impulse cannot be transmitted, then it also acts so no sensitivity can be felt so no sensitivity can be felt and if no sensitivity is felt that means it acts as a painkiller it acts as a painkiller and also a depressant also a depressant now if I write that for um, anthropine I need to also write content for isirin so for that of isirin for isirin now 
remember a syringe stimulate electrical impulse so with a syringe now neurotransmitters can bind to receptors because a syringe break down the enzyme that destroyed neurotransmitters so neurotransmitters will now be available neurotransmitters neurotransmitters will be available and if it's available neurotransmitters is available so it's bind to receptors so which make it a stimulant opposed to the other one that makes it a depressant so that makes it um, if it's a stimulant there will be continuous flow continuous flow of impulse impulse to the nervous system So that's it. You can add other points if you want to, but that will give you a six mark. Now, a scientist, a scientist, a scientific paper was published in 1997 that described the effect of anabolic steroids on female athletes. Many of these athletes achieved great success in international sport competition during the 1960s and 1970s. Discuss the argument against the use of electricity anabolic steroids in sport uh, this is quite straightforward so anabolic steroid in increases muscle mass let me use as anabolic steroid increases muscle mass so it gives an unfair advantage it gives an unfair advantage To athletes who use them so athletes using them can be banned uh, because it has side effect on their health it has side effects on their health so such at least so such athlete uh, stop. I'll give you a three mark. Now the next question is this: choose from. So number four, it's say so, uh, table four point one shows four structures associated with the human male reproductive system completes table 4.1 by identifying the level of organization of uh, this level of organization of each structure choose your answer from the list so epithelium uh, layer is is a tissue this is a tissue a uh, nucleus uh, is an organelle so it's a cell structure sperm is a cell testis is an organ now we have a diagram here now from this diagram I know there will be a set of questions <coughs> that will be asked so make reference to it say table 4.2 shows information about the male system in figure 4.1 complete table 4.2 testes what's the function of the testes production of sperm then transport sperm but not urine which organ transports sperm but not urine the sperm duct We'll go back and look at the letters. Tube for urine and seminal fluid to pass the ureter. 
the prostate gland what's the function of the prostate gland it produces seminal fluid and which is usually nutrient rich seminal fluid which is rich in nutrients Then which one contains this testis is the scrotum. So let's look at um, where is the testis? This is the testis here. Yeah? So testis, this is the scrotum. Um, so C is the testis, B is the scrotum sac. So let's move forward. Then A will be the sperm duct. No, sorry. A is the urethra. Comes out. This will be the sperm duct. D is the sperm duct, which carries the sperm. This will be the urethra. Then um, E here should be our prostate gland, where the nutrient is added. Then think D here is the bladder. F, sorry, is the um, prostate gland. The prostate, sorry. Wasting time. Prostate gland. That's it. So, um, draw an X on figure 4.2 to show the structure. We have mitosis, meiosis occur. Meiosis occur at the testis where sperm is being made. So that's all. One mark. Then they say um, sperm and egg each have a nucleus which is diploid, which is haploid. Define a haploid nucleus. Um, so a haploid nucleus is a nucleus that contains one set of chromosomes. So one that have one set of chromosomes. Two set of chromosomes is diploid. Diploid is two set of chromosomes. Haploid is half one set of chromosomes. State the number of chromosomes in a in a human haploid. So you see, haploid is half. So it's 23. Now tissue called plus oh, TPS are human proteins that are used as a drug to break down blood clots. Now TPS break down blood clots by activating plasminogen. And here we are told that plasminogen is a protein that is always present in the blood. It's always present in the blood. Now, when activated, plasmin, uh, plasminogen forms a protease that break down fibrin molecules. Now, plasminogen is found in the plasma. State what is meant by the plasma. It's the liquid component of the blood. Uh, so, it's the liquid part. Liquid component. Of the blood. State the product of the action of proteins on the protein fibrin. So if it's a fibrin and proteins is the enzyme that break down a protein to amino acid. So the product will be amino acid. Now TPA can be produced by genetically engineered bacteria. Figure 5.1 shows some of the stages involved in genetically engineering a bacteria to make a TPA. Now we have uh, X, this is human insulin, DNA removed from a human cell, uh, which we have a complementary shape, you remove the plasmid from a bacteria cell, all have sticky ends joined together, inserted back to now produce and isolated later to produce the insulin. So let's see what kind of question do they want to ask here. First, state the name of structure A. So what is A first? 
a a a a a a a is a classmate then this will be isolated using x will be restriction enzyme but um, so a plus meat screw down fast please a is a plus meat then in the flowchart x represent the action of an enzyme on a molecule of dna State the name of this enzyme. When you enzyme that help in uh, X represent the action of an enzyme on a molecule called uh, of DNA. So there are two enzymes. The one that help to remove it from the human cell is referred to as the restriction enzymes. Then next, there's a TPA gene is inserted into structure a structure a remember is the plasmid now explain how the gene is inserted into structure a to form structure b structure b is uh, a recombinant dna uh, a plasmid sorry so first you cut an opening on a so first you isolate let me you isolate the TPA using restriction enzyme then you now also isolate B using restriction enzyme remember B is the plasmid you isolate it from the bacteria then after that you now cut it you cut the plasmid and the tpa to have complementary shape complementary shape using the same the same restriction enzyme so after that um, you now join the TPA to um, using the same restriction enzyme, there's something I need to add here. Forming sticky ends. God bless you. Forming sticky ends. Good. Then the next thing will be, you now join them. Join the TPA to the plasmid, which is structure B. using ligase enzyme using ligase enzyme using ligase enzyme uh, so I think that is all Now, before TPA was made by genetically engineered bacteria, it was only available from blood donated by people. So just one advantage of producing TPA by genetically engineered bacteria. Uh, why? So that there will be constant supply now. Constant supply. You can have things like... Um, um, so it's not you are not not dependent on blood donor on blood donor you will not have problem with looking for blood that matches with yours so <coughs> also it will help to provide um, to produce in large quantities And also, usually, there is no ethical concern.
Now, the genetically engineered bacteria produce mRNA. That is a copy of the human TPA gene. Explain the role of mRNA. <laughs> so mRNA is responsible for the manufacturing of, of protein. So that's one thing. So it's messenger ribonucleic acid. mRNA will do what? We travel from the nucleus. From the nucleus to the cytoplasm to the cytoplasm where it will do what pass through ribosomes where it will pass through ribosomes pass through ribosomes which will now uh, which will interpret it interpret or read it to make a particular protein that's all now the last question question six Equation 6, figure 6.1 shows some cells from the shoot tip of an onion. From the shoot tip of an onion, we have um, two cells here. We have cell, we have M and we have cell A. So let's see what the equation will be. So state the evidence visible. Steady evident visible in figure that identified as cell A is a plant cell. As simple now, here you have a lot of cell wall and vacuole. You can see these are vacuoles. These are cell walls. So here, presence of cell wall. There is also vacuole. Vacuum is also available. So, and also gives all of them have a regular shape. So, cell A is dividing by mitosis. State the role of mitosis in a shoot tip. Uh, mitosis is first the role. That's the function of mitosis. is for growth. Uh, it also helps in producing new cells. So, for cell division. division that's producing new cell and if it's for growth it will help to increase the root tip or shoot now the area label M is this, a mitochondria explain why mitochondria have an important role in dividing cells and uh, simple now so um, so dividing cells, cells require, require energy. So the mitochondria is the site for aerobic respiration. site for aerobic respiration respiration to produce energy to produce energy needed by mitosis for growth growth and making new cells and making new cells simple next is cells just um, behind a shoot tip absorb water and grow in length a plant hormone stimulates cell elongation and control the response of stem to gravity 
state the name of this is auxin, the name of the hormone in plant. Explain how the response of stem to gravity is controlled. The response of stem to gravity is controlled. So auxin is made in the shoot or root tip. That's the first thing because it's controlled by auxin, which is the hormone. Auxin is made on the shoot or um, shoot tip or stem tip. Whichever. That's the first thing you need to know. Now, uh, it moves from the tip to the lower part of the shoot. Or the darker or lower part of the shoot. So it moves from the tip to the low. Since it's gravity, if assuming it's... Um, to light it will move to the darker part but if it's gravity it moves to the lower from the tip to the lower side of the shoot lower side of the shoot or stem then the third point there will be um it stimulates cell elongation so it will now stimulate cell elongation which will make um, the stem to grow upward which makes stem to grow upward and root downward stop the next question some cells in the shoot tip become leaf cells and other become cells in the stem or in flower explain why it is important that only some of the genes in cell A <coughs> are expressed in these cells uh -uh. Are expressed in this cell so usually cells have yeah they are just asking you about specialized cells so um oh like with this plants have different functions uh -huh. plants have different structures that perform different functions so therefore the need for specialized cells plants have different different structures that performs different functions therefore the need for specialized cell The need for specialized cells which will now carry out different functions different functions uh, different functions so um, therefore therefore find out that therefore some genes are needed to make specific proteins uh, 
that's with help. to produce these specialized structures. 